Well, here it is. Um, I'm here, and of course, as most people know, I like to mix it up a little bit. I don't like to do the same old thing. So I think tonight we're going to do a little um, dig into the scriptures. A little. I basically, I have a question for you guys, and I want the, the body to give me an answer tonight. Okay? Um, lately, it seems like there's been a lot of things, uh, a lot of discussion coming up about um, the, what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and I hear it one way, and then I hear it another, and, and bouncing around. And so, I, preparing this message tonight, I had a couple different ideas I wanted to go, and I started thinking that's the way we were going to go, and the Lord shut me down, and, and every time He shut me down, it kept coming back to this. So I'm like, I really don't want to do, talk about this tonight, but here it is. So, okay, tonight the, the title is Discernment or Judging? Um... We read it, we can read, I got a lot of different scriptures we can go over, but I'm hoping that we get started in this. I'm throwing the question out. I want to know what is the biblical definition of judging, and what's the difference between judging and discernment? Where do you draw the line? Because I know that these days, if you talk to anybody about it, they want to throw out, well, you're judging me. You're judging me. That's all they want to do is saying, you're judging me. So I want to know as the body how we're supposed to handle this. That's why I'm throwing this out here to all the men and the women, and I'm trying to get different feels for it. Um, I know that in, I'll start off with, of course, one of the big ones, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Um, it says, judge not that ye not be judged for with judgment ye shall for with what judgment ye judge ye shall be judged and with what measure ye met it shall be measured to you again and why beholdest thou the mote in the brother's eye but considerest not the beam in thy own eye Um, or how will thy say to thy brother let me pull out the mote out of thine eye and behold a beam is in thy own eye um, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam in your own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat in the brother's eye. So that one is used a lot, especially number one. Um, that's thrown out there a lot. Um, the other one to me is kind of on the other opposite end. Does this do John 7:24? Judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment. So, it kind of sounds a little bit like it's conflicting, because it says you're supposed to judge righteously, but yet the other one says you're not really supposed to judge. So, I guess I'm going to kind of throw the question out there. Does anybody have any thoughts on this, or does anybody have any scripture that they want to share tonight? Would would you read that John again? John... Uh, what is it, 724, did you say? Yes, 7, 724. It, it talks about judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Okay, I agree with that, of yep. course, right? Yep. This is uh, Matthew 7, 1 through 4, yep. in the Amplified. In the okay. ampl- that's, I was hoping somebody would bring a different one. Because okay. I know in some of them, judge is referred to as discernment well, so it, it says do not judge and criticize and condemn others unfairly with an attitude of self-righteous superiority as though assuming the office of a judge so that you will not be judged unfairly for just as you hypocritically judge others when you are sinful and unrepentant so will you be judged in accordance with your standard of measure you used to pass out judgment judgment will be measured to you why do you look at the insignificant speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice and acknowledge the egregious log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me give the, get the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own? You hypocrite, play actor, and pretender, first get the log out of your own eye, 
and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. To me, I, I think, you know, it's when you, when you go to help somebody, right. judge, you're judging in a way of love and, and, and discernment. Mm -hmm. You know, you may not even do that for a while before praying. And if you do, it's a heart, hopefully, of gold to, to help your brother or sister and not to rule over them and, and feel like you could never do that or will never do that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the Bible says, you know, be careful when you think you stand lest you fall. So um, it's just out of a, the kind of heart you have when you do it. Yeah. I, I, do, I do like that version of yeah. it on that one because that, that makes it, to me, and understand it a little clearer. So anybody else? Well, it's interesting. I think like God wants us to take care of what's, what's wrong with us first. Don't be like, oh, I'm just going to go and fix everyone. Everyone else is the problem. I'm, I'm great. Um, so like the, like work on, you're the one who can, who can change. You can't change someone else's heart. You can't change someone else, but you can go before the Lord and he can change you. That's where you first start. Mm -hmm. But then it does say that you can, after like that's right. And the Lord's like helped you, freed you, like healed you. Then you can get a speck out of your brother's eye. And so I'm assuming by then you're loving them and you know, right where they've been. And you're so thankful God's gotten you out of that. So you want to come alongside them rather than ignoring your problems and focusing on everybody else's. So is it kind of, is it kind of commanded also to mm -hmm. like come alongside a brother? I don't know. I want to <laughs> talk more about that. I think, uh, I think the key was if you're coming at it as being self-righteous. Mm -hmm. So it kind of piggybacks on what Christine said too is if, yeah, if you're coming at it, but you already have all these problems, I think the Lord, what he does is he takes our failings and helps us overcome them. And then, then we can minister to somebody that has the same thing. So mm -hmm. he lets us go through those things so that we can help some. And, and then we're not being self-righteous. We're saying, we, here, we, I was in that same position, so I know what you're going through. Right. And I see right. it. And, you know, this is what the Lord has done for me. I'm hoping this fits in what Lisa was saying um, in Galatians 6 1 says brethren if a man be overtaken taken in a fault ye which are spiritual restore such one such in one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted and so yeah just I think that's a scripture that um, speaks exactly what Lisa was saying you know like you want to restore them um, spiritually but you have to have that the spirit of Christ that meekness and you know uh, thankfulness you know that you haven't yet been tempted in that and you know fallen in that sin I know for me like there's been times that you know I will say something to someone else but then right away the Holy Spirit will convict me and I'll be like you know um, I'm not gonna be do say that because he's then the God will be I can just see him shaking his head and say now my my daughter you know it wasn't too long ago you were doing the same thing so I just feel like you can't point the finger at anybody you know um, and to me it's like another brother or sister you know you can go to someone with correction you know and and show them scripture verse in the Bible but far as to judge somebody else or point the finger I don't believe we're to do that that's God's job you know but there is times that I know there's scripture that backs it up that says you know we are to lift another brother or sister up, you know, but to um, judge somebody, n no. I don't believe that we're to do that because that only, I think, just hurts people and it's not, they're not gonna look at you and be like, yeah, okay, you're supposed to be a loving Christian, but you're just pointing the finger at me, you know, and, and talking about me or, you know, whatever you're saying to that person. You know, there's been plenty of times me and my sister go rounds, you know, and, 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 um, I don't know, she, she's a hard one for me to visit with sometimes, but, you know, I just really know that I've been convicted before by the Holy Spirit, you know, because I guess if your own household isn't in order, then I don't really believe anyone has any right to go and, like, judge or point the finger at anyone. Yeah, I have a couple of scriptures <coughs> that I'll share here. So the, uh, there's a, 
there's one. I, I would just, I'll share this one to kind of maybe uh, shed some light on what my mom just said. Uh, because I think we have to dif differentiate between issues in the church versus the unbeliever. Like, uh, I think you deal with those things differently. Like, I don't... <laughs> I think I think deep down to me uh, the unbeliever knows they're a sinner. They know that they've done wrong. So I mean that uh, you you do call it out. I mean especially if they're uh if they're proud of their sin or they th you know like if they're trying to s justify something I think you mm -hmm. have to share share with them scripture but <clears throat> how you deal with them versus how you deal with your brother or sister in Christ I would argue would be you, a little bit different. You and must you must be reading my mind because that was going to be my next question. Is is we're, what yeah. a lot of what we're talking about is with the brethren. Yeah. How do you do that compared to the non? Yeah. So yeah. I would. This is a. This is a. There's two scriptures I'll share. So this is First Corinthians, uh, chapter five, and in First Corinthians they're dealing with a man. Uh, the Corinthian church has a man amongst the brethren that is actually. Um, have you know committing sexual immorality with his mother-in-law essentially and the apostle paul essentially tells the church why is he there fellowshipping with you you need to essentially turn him over to satan uh, get him out of there he, he he does not belong in fellowship with you guys if he's in open rebellion um but essentially this is what it says i wrote to you in my letter not to associate this is first corinthians 5 verse 9 I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what I've... what have I to do with judging outsiders? I think he means those outside of Christ. Mm -hmm. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. So he's telling the church to essentially deal with the, the individual who is committing sin within the, the body of Christ. And then I would argue that uh, Jesus affirms that decision in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, this is verse 15, and this is where I would get uh, like my doctrine on how we do church discipline. It says this in uh, Matthew 18, 15, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So ultimately, the goal is, like Kyle said, you want to see that person restored. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And that's Jesus talking, right? So there's the church mm -hmm. is already established at that point. Tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church... Let him be as a Gentile or a cl tax collector. Um, so he's essentially a dog. He's not a part of us. And then, you know, the, the one verse that we all used, you know, in prayer, but I think it's talking about actually judgment on that person is verse 18 through 20. And it says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on an earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. Um, essentially, Jesus is saying, you know, if uh, when we do uh, go through with church discipline, we've done it the right way, we've addressed them individually, we've brought another brother or a couple witnesses, now we've brought it before the church. Jesus says, listen, I'm there, I'm approving the judgment that you just made to forsake this brother, treat him like a Gentile or a tax collector because he's naming the name of Christ, but yet he's continuing in his sin. And that person, it says pretty clearly, do not associate with them, do not eat with them. Um, they're essentially a dog, you know, that's what he compares them to. Mm -hmm. I, w I would say 
It's exactly right. Consistently, um, you have to keep the heart of uh, of Christ when you're doing it. I mean, when he was reviled, he reviled not. Now, you know, we, we have a problem. We don't do that sometimes, but especially in discipline, um, you start to get worked up. You start to get upset when you see things. Um, we don't have discipline in the general church like there should be. There's like in churches around here, there's no discipline. Um, you, you think that uh, it sounds rough to be judging somebody in the church. Uh, back up a couple verses to where Curtis was in chapter 5 at verse 1 through 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and you have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So Paul's saying, you have done nothing. You haven't said anything. You haven't even cared about it. And he goes on, For verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, uh, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Good. And you know what? Praise the Lord, because uh, later on Paul goes on and he says, I know what I told you. He says, now this person, I'm just paraphrasing, has repented. Restore such a one unto the body. You know, he's did whatever he's supposed to do, you know, and right. you have did what you have did. Now stand down a little bit, bring him back in. So whatever was done, I believe, was done out of love, uh, was done out of uh, compassion, I hope. Um, but Paul had some pretty strenuous words for him there before. Yeah. You know, that nothing yeah. was taking place. But what do you do if you have a church body, you're supposed to be resembling Christ, and there's all manner of things going on, in particular this, mm -hmm. and nothing's going on? What's the world going to say? Well, what, what's different about what's them different. than yeah. out here? Looks the same. You know? Yep, exactly. Um, I, in that same verse scripture in First Corinthians, it says that they were puffed up in verse two about that, letting that happen, or like just letting it go. And that in verse six, it says, "Your glorying is not good." And don't you know a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump? So they were were they like proud of themselves that they were look how gracious we are that we I don't know what they were like. It seems like there was some pride involved instead of love involved. Is that right or wrong? Well, I think maybe, too, uh, we were just debating, me and my wife, not debating, but talking, uh, what it, like, normally when I have these interactions with the non-believer, even, like, sharing the gospel of Jesus with them, immediately there's a reaction of, oh, well, you're judging me. You know what I mean? Well, when Jesus says we need to repent, we have to turn from sin, regardless of what it is, whatever your sin may be, you know what I mean? Because there's, there's a variety uh, so it, it doesn't matter like that to me isn't really the focus the focus is we're all sinners and we need Jesus Christ for redemption but many times when you're having those conversations uh, they do think that you're like you are judging them so maybe we need to define that and then um, like clarify what, what, what actual like yeah at some point God will judge you for your sin. You're going to stand before God. You're going to give an account for every one of your sins. Now, we as the believer, we're not, we're not trying to judge them. I'm not trying to say, uh, essentially, hey, I'm the, I'm the judge and executioner, and uh, unless you, you know, come through me, it, there's no hope. But we're just ones that are, I mean, observing. Okay, hey, I see this in your life. That's sin. That's wrong. You need to turn from that sin, and you need to put your trust in Jesus for salvation. But I think that can come off as, for a lot of people who are easily offended or whatever, in this society, people are so easily offended. I mean, it doesn't take much to get under people's skin. Um, so I don't know if that 
if that helps but i think just the the reaction that i get all the time is that yeah i'm a lot of times people think i'm very judgmental <laughs> maybe i am i i don't know <laughs> well see that's what i was going to ask you is this with a non-believer if you call out sin is i mean they're going to scream at you that that that's judging them so how do you relate to an unbeliever with sharing the word and making them realize they're a sinner, not the same as I am. I mean, it's not that they're, I'm not a sinner and they are. We're both sinners, but I'm saved by the grace of God, by his blood. How do you come across to a non-believer without them wanting to scream? I mean, is there a certain way to come across to share the truth without having them scream judgment at you? Or... Is that just the way the world's going to be? Is this where the discernment comes in? Like, if you're doing it without the prompting of the Lord, I right. think is, is um, something to think about. Because if you're doing it in the right way, if you're doing it discerning how he wants you to do it, do we care whether they get... <laughs> yeah, see, there, there's <laughs> do we care one. whether they scream... You're judging me. If right. we're doing it the way the Lord wants us to do it, the way he's prompted us to do it, do we care? Right. Good question. Steve. I guess, you know, and we've talked about it before, you know, numerous times I've witnessed to people, you know, and they, they try to dispute, you know, well, there is no God. It's just a book written by men. And I, but the number one thing is, in any of us, when we give our own personal testimony, what God has done in our life, that's one thing they can't dispute because this has happened to me. This is how you know. This is how God has moved in my life. So that's one thing that I've used numerous times, and seen the working of the Holy Spirit by giving my personal testimony, what God has done in my life. How I could see them really now perceiving and understanding. Hey, maybe there is a God, and they actually um, the Holy Spirit can work on them. You know, to uh, to witness to them. So. Uh, for many, many years, we were in a church where it was all about love and use words only when necessary. And so that's what we did, is we just loved people and we didn't see any fruit in that. And so then we, I went the other direction where I felt in order to be loving, I needed to share the truth. And uh, so, I mean, my heart is to share the truth with people how they receive it is on them, but my heart is to share the truth. Um, but for the first time in my life, after many, many years, with our youngest daughter, Abby's telling me just love her. And I have such peace about it. I don't even have a desire to share truth with her because God's telling me just to love her. And so it is so important to have discernment, to know when to speak and when to be quiet. Um, but uh, I also had a couple of thoughts. Um, when you're talking about church discipline, as somebody who has been supposedly disciplined, uh, you have to, uh, if you are disciplined in a body that is not, uh, is not right with the Lord, then sometimes you can be disciplined because God wants to use it for your good in his glory, if that makes any sense. Um, and what... I think Genesis 5.20 it is, what the enemy intended for evil, God will bring good. And I mean, when we're talking about being disciplined in the body, I think there's a lot of, a lot of aspects to it. Um, and the last thing is, one of the things that I was told lately, and maybe somebody has a differing opinion or different thoughts, is that we're not supposed to judge if somebody's saved or not. That, that it's actually a sin. I was told I'm sinning if I judge if somebody's saved or not. Well, I hear this discussion of, well, you're going to talk to an unbeliever. Well, if you're saying somebody's an unbeliever, then you're saying they're not saved. So just if anybody had any thoughts on if, if it is a sin. Sorry if I'm talking too much. No. Uh, I'm probably not answering the, your question, but um, Colossians... Four, I think five. It says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. 
Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You need salt and light. I think what Curtis and I were talking about before, like the word judge or you're judging me or whatever is misused. Like what is, what does that mean when you say that? So I just Googled judge, like what's the definition of judging, right? So there's judges, Mm -hmm. which is not really what we're talking about. Um, But to judge is basically to form an opinion or conclusion about which we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it's a person who is able or qualified to give an opinion on something. And I think that goes to your discernment point. The Lord has given us discernment, has given us wisdom to be able, we should be able to form conclusions based on our observations, based on what the Holy Spirit is telling us. So when I'm judging or whatever, I'm not I'm not executing a conviction on you or, you know, um, the other definition was to decide a verdict on someone. That is when people say, you know, only God can judge me or whatever. Like, that's God's judgment is when you stand before him and he says, you know, away from me, I never knew you or so that's his that's his doing. But we can judge in the sense of I'm observing you, I'm forming this conclusion based on what I see, what I hear, what the Holy Spirit's telling me, etc. So I don't think in that instance it's incorrect. So is would that fall more under discernment than it would be judging? I mean Yes, but I'm also I also might be forming a conclusion. Yeah. Like is that person's fruit showing that they're saved or not? Um, I believe we can f- we can form a conclusion, which is the definition of that. Right. So, technically, I right. per that I would be judging using discernment. Right. right. So, Kyle, because because I was going to say real quick is I know for a long time we, when we were talking about it, the wife and I and and, and stuff, it was like, what where do you draw the line between discernment and judging? Because it's like, you could be considered judged every day because if we, if we go somewhere to visit a church, you're going to go into this church, you got to have discernment whether you want to be there or whether they're off, they're not teaching what they're supposed to be. Some people would call that, you know, we used to say, well, that's kind of judging. You're judging that church, you're judging the pastor whether he's preaching the, the gospel or whether he's some watered down thing or you know a different one um and so it was always kind of like we were kind of trying to decide what's the line between judging and discerning and you know how do you navigate that line without because i last thing i want to do is judge somebody you know unrighteously because i don't want i want christ's forgiveness not to be judged you know so that's go ahead kyle (coughs) yeah i think it's, there's manifold things here too that, but you always got to go back to the condition of the heart whenever it's discerning your judgment. We know we just read the passage that it says if any is a fornicator or a swindler, whatever it was, don't eat with them even. Okay, mm-hmm. that's making a decision. That's looking at some things and saying, okay, this is what I'm seeing, not to do that. Okay, it's not a guess. It's not a hunch. It's not a a feeling. It's you know you see somebody and they're doing this. What the Bible just said, they're, they're operating in that mode. That's okay? an obvious. Not a one-time thing. They're continuous action verb, fornicator. Yeah. Okay? All right. Then it says not to eat with them. Well, that's, that's plain to see. But I think also we're, we're thinking about something else here that we don't consider is that uh, Jesus says in uh, John 16, before I say this scripture, I'll say this, that you sit down with people that are not Christians and you talk to them, you have scripture. Some people will get hostile. Some people don't care. Uh, some people are going to be the best of friends with you. It's all a range, a plethora of the scale of how they react, okay? What's the difference, okay? Mm-hmm. We know that, and I will say this too, a testimony is great, but a testimony is not the word of God. The word of God comes in, and when the Spirit of God, if you're full of the Spirit of God, if you're operating under the Holy Ghost, you're doing what's right, 
and you're, you're, you're just living for the Lord, then here's what it says in Matthew, or excuse me, John 16, uh, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you that truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. Okay? So he reproves the world of sin. He may be reproving the, the world or the people in it, and you don't even know it. You're around somebody, you're talking, you're using scripture, okay? St. John chapter 12, verse 47. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. Hmm. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, his words, okay, um, hath one that judges him the word that I have spoken. It's the word that judges. So the Spirit of God, the Word of God, when you come across somebody, you know, and uh, years ago I had some guys, they were uh, partiers and drunkards, and they, they said to me once, they were giving me a razzing me or whatever, and, and they said, this is the only verse I had at the time, I just gave it to them. They said, well, what do you say about drinking, Gomez, you know, and the, whatever, there's three or four of them. I says, well, the Bible says, a drunkard shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, I don't know, that's what the Holy Ghost gave me, that's what I had. So hopefully it did what it was supposed to do, yeah. you know, because, uh, you know what, by golly, if you're in drunkenness, you're not going to enter in. Yeah. So that's not what I'm saying. That's not Kyle 1-1. You know, yep. that's the Bible. Right. So, you know, I mean, but still, if we come in with the Bible, we could have a hardened heart, a bitter heart, be mad at somebody or want to get back at somebody. Then it isn't going to make a hill of beans, you know. Right. Um, the Holy Ghost isn't probably operating in that. Right. He, he might be, right. I don't know. But, yeah. but in any case, the Word of God and the Spirit of God is going to do things to people. They're going to make you, they're going to make them react. Yep. I was up at a place a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and went back to the back and seen a guy, and as soon as he seen me, he ran out the other door. You know, so it, w did I do anything to him? No. You know, so, but the, but the Word of God and the Spirit of God will cause people to do and say things, and they're going to say that exactly. Why are you judging me? Right. I'm not judging you. The Word of God is Word judging is. you. Yep. You know? Yep. Right. And they, and they, and they, that's right. Exactly. And, and that's what a lot of times when somebody throws that at you that you're judging me, I say, no, I'm not judging you. The, by, the word is judging you. you know? So we, we've, we've talked pretty good about uh, the brother and the church, the way it's supposed to operate and judge. Um, oh, Christine. Okay, so there is a difference because Jesus sat with sinners. So, and like, like there's a difference of sitting with sinners and you're sharing the truth with them then when people are in church saying they're Christians and they're blatantly sinning and not repenting. So there's a difference. Yep. And they're, because he's saying, don't eat with them. Right. But yet Jesus is going in with sinners that these guys are pretending to be Christians or saying, or they, they are Christians or whatever. I don't know, whatever, but they're sin. just sorry to, to yep. clarify that. Yep. Yep. When when it's saying eat don't eat with them, I mean it's like don't be buddy buddy and do the things that they're doing. Right. You the, know. Yeah. Jesus. It kind of makes it clear that not even to associate with them, though. I think is the well, way I read. Unless you're gonna minister unless, like Jesus did. Right. Then, yeah. If they're in the church saying they're Christians and they're outright sinning, and you're being buddy buddy with them, isn't that deceiving them as well? Like making them feel comfortable in their sin, they do. They can have, they can be a Christian and just not turn from that sin. Isn't that well, making them more comfortable and thinking, I, oh, I can do this too? And then other people think, oh, that's good. It, we can all like. Is there like well, a, I think a bad there, effect? If their sin is obvious like that, you you need to call it out. I mean, that's I think that's what the word says is you need to call it out and and confront them about. It. And if they don't receive it, then you get another brother or sister, and you go to them and talk to them and, and do it the way you're, you know. I can't remember what you said, but you said not to associate. I, I don't know that you meant associate. Did you mean associate? Well, that, that's kind of the way 
the word says is you're not supposed to eat with them or, or so, you know what I'm saying, to associate with them if they're living in blatant sin. Isn't that the way you, the, the word's saying? Yeah, I mean, this is a, and this is a believer. Right. Somebody who's a brother. But if he's, if he's acting out, he's in sin. Yeah, you, we do church discipline. And after, I believe, if church discipline has been put in place, yeah, he says treat them like a Gentile. They are a non-believer. Do not right. eat with them. Do not associate with them. Right. I mean, I don't know how else. If they don't turn and repent. Yeah. Yeah. Don't associate with them. Do not keep company. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. You won't even eat. So you won't even eat with them. Yep. Right. Well, yeah, I'm sure that there's a lot of people, that does include Christian and not Christian, that thinks like judging people like me is gonna get them closer to the heaven, you know, and I'm just saying like I don't think that anybody who can hate people like me, people are different, you know, is going to get any closer to heaven, you know, I'm just saying that. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you by experience because bec uh, way before I come here, I was Catholic and I got judgmental by priests, you know. They call me a lot of names. They call me so many names that I think that I forgot my name sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just saying like, I'm not perfect. I'm human like anybody else and I'm not better than anybody, but I'm not worse than anybody. And I think that people need to hate less and love more. Because I think that's what God wants for everybody. Well, I think that comes back to a little bit like Kyle was saying, it's about the heart. I know some have said, but I'm not sure if we're totally differentiating here all the time. If you are a child of God, if you are partaking in an assembly, then it's the assembly's responsibility to make sure that if that person is sinning, to address it. If the person is not a child of God's, doesn't claim to be a child of God, we associate with them, we live around them, we deal with them, we love on them. Because Paul said we would have to be out of this world if we were going to not associate with those people, with the, the people of the world. I guess those people, this is kind of a sad way I put it, but the people of the world, we need to be there and loving on them. How, how else can they know the love of God if we turn our backs on them and say, well, we can't associate with you? We most certainly can associate with them. We don't have to partake in what they partake but we certainly can associate with them. But those of the body, those are the ones we are supposed to be addressing. And I think sometimes, I guess the way I'm, I'm sitting here listening, and I'm not sure who are we talking about here? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm hearing it wrong too, but, you know, as a believer, you know, I, I go and share with a lot of people and make no mistake, you know, I love Nelson with all my heart and soul, and I have told Nelson the truth, and he knows exactly how I feel about, and, and we, we're good friends, and if I didn't tell him the truth, then I told him I wouldn't love you. But, you know, um, Nelson, you know, I pray for him all the time, and maybe he's, you know, I pray that God, he'll be wonderfully saved, you know, and God, you know, when that time comes, you know, I do pray, and, and he knows that. We've had a lot of good conversations and, you know, um, there's a lot of people, I mean, so I don't know if I heard it right that, you know, if you're a believer, then you shouldn't continue to be hanging out with other believers, if that's what I heard Christine say or somebody. But, you know, like today we went on a long bike ride, but I haven't seen Nelson in a while, you know, and I wanted him to come to church tonight, you know, and so we did go on a long bike ride and we don't just talk about worldly things, you know, um, we talked a lot about the Lord and different other things, you know, so I guess we I'd be in the wrong church if, if that's the case, so. I think we need to identify what, what it's mean, what they mean by associate. Um, it's not that you can't um, go and minister to people. It's right. how you're doing that. Well, so are you yeah, going to go and do the things that they're doing and say that you're ministering I don't know if that's the right place to do that. Right. And, you know, and I, think I think it comes back to a little bit of that discernment because you're going to discern, is this somebody that's supposed to be a brother 
born again believer or is this somebody that's not saved yet because you know if they're if they're coming to church on a regular basis the way i understand it and they're claiming to be a born again believer and they're blatantly living in sin that's when the assembly needs to address that but if they're a non-believer then we've got to minister to that right yeah okay but there's still a way to do that so for example like there's part of my family that are not saved mm -hmm. and they'll invite me and, and my kids to go to functions where I know all they're doing is drinking. I don't participate in that right. even though, you know, they're my family and I can minister to them. I'm not going to minister in that situation to them. Right. So I think that's the, the deciding factor. How are you, how are you um, eating with them? How are you, associating with them right. so you know but, i'm not going to go to their party right well i don't think you know? i don't know that we said that an unbeliever we're not supposed to associate with him i was just phrasing what the scripture said about a brother that's living in blatant sin and the church has addressed him and they do not repent then that's when i think that it says you are not to associate with them but i still think that there's there's things to follow even with non-believers you know well, I mean? yes yeah God's heart is for us to turn to him our sin is not him it's everything it's it'll lead to destruction and death his heart is to turn to him he like even with like a brother like in the church and doing that and like and not turning they're they're like loving the sin and not turning to the one that loves them like so much he bled and died to like set them free to know him to have a new heart and so the whole point of even cutting someone off like that is so they turn to him right. he doesn't want them to be away he wants them to be but if they're just staying in there and it's like simmering it's it's he says it's a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump and right. he wants them to turn if you make it comfortable it takes them longer and like it makes it deceives them and, and so God's heart is for us to turn, turn to him. God's heart is for, that's why he goes and sits with sinner. That's why he came after me. I was, I, he didn't come after me because I was nice and clean and sinless. He came after me while, while I was yet a sinner. Like he came after me and died for me. But he doesn't want us to stay. He wants to set us free. He, he wants us to have him. And our sin, it's just, it's a deception. It leads to destruction every time. And he alone leads us to everlasting life. So... Like the Lord's heart is like it's just perfect in in those situations. I remember back in time uh, when I used to be Catholic and I used to be back in church and I have like a big speaking to everybody and I was saying that the best way that people that are believers and people that are not believers the best way is like if the Christian come out and they speak about God to the regular people and I think that's the way. I mean like. I think like there's a lot of people out there that are like scared of going to a church for, for being judged, you know? So I think that there's a line that needs to be break, you know? I think that, I'm not saying like one of the, um, the Christians on the ground or the outside people like me are ground, I'm just saying there's a big line that needs to be broken. That's the line that divides Christian by the outside people. If people want to speak about God and spread the word, they need to come out and say, not just being sitting inside church and not welcoming other people from the outside. They need to be friendly. Christians and the outside people. I think there's a basis of respect and I'm an outside person. I'm not a Christian. I do believe in God and I feel respect for God. But I'm not a I'm not consider myself Christian because I'm openly a sinner. But I think like uh, there's like a big line that needs to be broken. I think that if you guys want to speak about God and spread the word of God, you need to come out. Don't stay inside the church because when you stay inside the church you're giving your back to a lot of people out there. Thank you. Well, yeah, and I think to Nelson's point, I mean, Nelson would not be here had we not gone out. You know, we met Nelson on the streets of Norfolk. Uh, me and Peter actually had a great conversation and, um, you know, invited him to Norfolk. And I don't think, you know, I don't think Nelson would continue to come if he didn't know that we loved him and cared about him. Right. Um, and I think he's 100% right. I think we do need to get out more and continue to love on. I mean, that's what Jesus did. If we're saying here 
that we can't associate with sinners, then Jesus was a sinner. You know, Jesus sinned, right. um, and that's not true. But um, so I think there is a difference here between one, like people who are obviously they they need help. They're out there. They're suffering. Jesus is there for them. You know, and then on the other hand, you see also Jesus really being hard on the religious Pharisees, the people who thought they were better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, he was rebuking those people. And then also, I think, a differentiation, uh, differentiation between um, those outside who aren't a part of the church, they're not believers, um, and then those within the church, which I think you, you made that point. You know, right. I think you have to deal with each circumstance a little bit better. And, and one other thing i just add, um, because I, I can... I mean, it was 10 years ago, but I remember when I was not saved. I remember when uh, I was in my rebellion, I was in my sin, and I didn't notice it at the time, but I can look back now in my life, and I'm sure many of you guys can, if you're a believer, you can look back and remember those conversations where a Christian came into your life, and I remember it very distinctly, uh, People come, Christians coming into my environment which wasn't good, you know, par a party. Yeah, you know, I can remember a distinct party. I'm drinking. There's all kinds of fornication going on. There's, there's crazy music. There's pot smoke. There's crazy things going on. And yet here's my Christian brother, uh, who wasn't my brother at the time because I, uh, I was lost, but he's sitting there with me, uh, and he's not drinking. He's not associating with any of this stuff. And... I remember asking him, why are you here? What are you doing? Why are you, why do you even want to be here? And he just says, I love you and I care about you. You're my friend. And, uh, I can remember at the time, oh, I laughed it off like, oh, that's, you're, you're stupid. You know, this is dumb. You don't belong here. And, um, but looking back, I can remember that and, and I can know, I knew that God was using that conversation to pierce my heart. Uh, and I thank God for those conversations and I had multiple of those conversations before I was born again. So I think, um, you know, be sensitive because yeah, even those environments like Lisa's talking about, they're not good. And I would say I would, I would be very wise, maybe even bringing my kids in those environments. Maybe it's something you do with another brother. Uh, I remember me and Nelson went into dark situations when my brother was, you know, in a drug house and I'm like, dude, let's go in. Let's go get it. We bound the strong man. We prayed, Lord, we're going to bind the strong man. We bind Satan. And we went in there and God just revived the whole place, you know? Mm -hmm. So you got to be wise. Um, but we do, we have to reach out to the loss for sure. Oh, I don't think we're not, I don't think we're saying that. So I right. just want to be clear. Definitely. And that, and that was, and that showed good discernment on your part though, Curtis, because there was at least two of you yeah. as a backup. Go yep. Go in twos. That's, that's good. Yeah, like even even Curtis is saying the the order of things, you know, like going out by twos. I mean, there's a lot, I think uh, I'm just just a little bit with this me. I was learning this reading, like okay, there is structure to witnessing. There's structure in certain situations. And in fact, in the church, it's that's what most of the New Testament seems to be about is church structure and our witness to the lost. So it's a huge. It's all written about that. Is that also too like regarding wisdom and discernment? Um, also, God is providence in our situations so one of the things that they've heard multiple people say including pastor paul is like there's specific people that in your life that god um has there for you to uh witness to that he opens the doors we don't we should we uh he opens those doors and he gives the ability to uh say what we need to say and do what we need to do and uh that, that's what's really interesting though so even because like i may not go be go to a like to be in a dark situation like a bar or uh be in dark or maybe being like even even um uh, law enforcement facilities can be a very very dark place so just listening to a podcast about that you know there's a whole there's different levels and different areas that um where christian where god has called them to be or god has put them like just literally like this is your job and even though there's darkness in your job with these certain areas i've put you here i'm preserving you i'm going to open doors that no man can shut and shut doors that no man can open. And because of God's providence, you don't have to be worried like, well, I mean, well, you're supposed to be in the world. You're just not supposed to be of it. So, I mean, even what Lisa's saying, you can be 
and even with your own family members be in a darker situation than, let's say, most of the other people or some other person in the church. Their family members are born again Christians, most of them. But it doesn't make you um, any less of a Christian because if God's called you and put you there for a reason and you're actually, God's using you to impact them or even just his spirit, then yes, be there, do what you need to do. Um, and just rest that the Lord is guiding you and directing you in that thing. And I struggle with that all the time. I don't rest. <laughs> I fight it sometimes. But yeah, the Lord's good there. Um, I just want to say, I don't know, I always felt comfortable coming up here. And I've been making a lot of excuses not to come up here. And um, <clears throat> if it wasn't uh, for Curtis, um, he probably doesn't know when he spoke at the Ponca a long time ago, he touched my spirit and I felt love. And then I got invited to come up here and I felt a lot of love and went to, you know, church camp. And that was a turning point for me. And um, <clears throat> if it wasn't for two Christians, um, I was living in Omaha last, I don't know, six months or so. And I overdosed in April. And um if it wasn't for my friends i just met them um through another friend and they're big believers and christians and they show me love and they guided me through it and um i saw the white light and um when i came out of it um i just felt the spirit it was like a spiritual awakening and you know, I get to share about that today to other addicts and alcoholics down in Norfolk. And um, the guys I'm living with look up to me, and I'm not afraid of saying the Lord. And um, there's a couple other guys that talk to me then about it. And there's a certain way of doing it. There's a, you know, going over the head with it or, you know, just like, suggest it and um, be more assertive. And I haven't had a bad, um, you know, for say something happened or they get pissed. Um, I just um, keep it really easy and cool. And um, today, you know, I'm happy to be alive. And I love you guys. And I'm going to start coming back again. And I just want to say thanks for all the scriptures and um I'm going to bring that back and talk to the guys about. And, well, I love you guys, and I'll go ahead and pass that. Thank you. I'm just so thankful that God knows I'm not perfect <laughs> and that I make mistakes. And when I say something and I shouldn't and I repent, he, he forgives. Or, I mean, he's just so full of grace, and I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, and I would just say one other thing. <clears throat> like... Uh, you know, I've had people, like Lisa's called me out on things. Uh, Jamie, we had an instance in, at youth camp. I was called out for some certain things. And, uh, like, initially, like, your flesh wants to maybe get mad and get defended. But I think, you know, and the Lord's graciously teaching me this because I'm not perfect. <laughs> but I think if you step back and, okay, say, okay, does my sister in Christ, do, does she care about me? Is she against me? I don't think so, right? I mean, I think they want the best for me. So you need to really take serious when somebody does bring something to you. Take it serious. Uh, really think about it before you just start to react. I know the flesh wants to react. So I would just encourage you to take time, take a step back, and maybe really think about what they're saying. Because maybe it is true, and maybe it's not. Uh, maybe they're they're wrongfully saying something, but I would still always uh, just take a step back, take a breather, and think about what they're saying. And if it's true, then uh, maybe you need to address something. And most most of the time, it's true. You know what I mean? And I have yeah. to address something. So I was just thinking about um, like I've listened to. Um, not in person, but some of these street preachers online. And a lot of times there's, there's people standing around them and getting upset and like and saying the whole, you're judging me, you guys are judgmental and different things like that. And I mean, you just look at the Old Testament and there's so much of God's judgment 
And even if somebody would would to get um, offended for a short time here on earth, in that moment of walking by a street preacher that was pre- that was preaching a truth to them to turn and repent, you know, I guarantee, you, and I think we we would all think the same that if they ended up in hell, that they would wish they would have listened longer. They would have wished that they would have stood there and listened to that preacher that they thought was judgmental, but in reality, there was they were preaching love. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, judgment from God. I mean, that's is, is the judgment. I mean, that's. I mean, that's the other part, apart from the grace and the mercy and the different things. But I mean, you can't leave out the judgment. So. I just don't want anybody to misunderstand the things that I have been saying. Um, by all means, because, you know, even Curtis said, you know, that the Lord led, led them to go to a party. Right. By all means, if you need to be obedient to the Lord, if he's telling Absolutely. you to do that. But right. you just need to be careful. And you don't want to um, compromise in saying that I'm going to be ministering or I'm going to be spreading the gospel and, you well, know, you're I not led to do it in that situation. I so you just have to be, have discernment and be obedient. A lot of and wisdom. not everybody's going to be, not everybody's going to do what I do with my family. Right. Not everybody's going to be led to do it that way. Right. So I don't want you to misunderstand. If the Lord's telling you to do that, by all means, you know, right. go ahead and do that. But and, and I think a lot, of, careful. a lot of wisdom comes in that too, because... It definitely, if you're by yourself and the Lord leads you to do something, you need to do it. But I think like in a deal where Curtis was talking about where they were going into this, that shows wisdom when you got another brother to go with you. Because there's two of you, you know. Even Jesus sent out the disciples two at a time. So there's a lot of wisdom in that. So, Well, also to, to destiny and um, everybody else talking too, like it's... The Bible talks about um, in John 7, 7, uh, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. So it's interesting that we're talking about the judging thing, because it's like, I mean, I, I don't know the correct definition for the word judging, and I looked back in the, while well, you guys were talking, the 1828 dictionary, and there's legit like 10 definitions under the word judge. I'm like, dang, including like all of that you guys said it's like all listed underneath there so i'm like oh my goodness but to make a distinction talking about the judging specifically in the in the part of god's wrath towards our sin and sinners and, and whether we're covered in the blood of jesus or not is the determinator of whether we're going to heaven or hell taking that you know how he sends uh jesus sends everybody into the world he says send to them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature in mark sixteen fifteen. So pairing up those two verses, uh, make the distinction that we're not judging the ultimate judgment sending people to heaven and hell. We're not doing that. But we are called on God's behalf to display what he is going to do and what he is doing in this earth. So it is interesting. So because in that verse, he says they don't hate you, implying that they're going to, implying that they're going to hate you. They don't hate you for you. They hate you for me. So it's interesting. They will attribute the hate towards God towards you and say, you're judging me because it's the flesh. It's, it's the flesh basically replying to the spirit saying like, I don't want this. I don't, you know, they, they, the, like the, they, they go towards the darkness. So the light came into the world. They love the darkness more. And so um, they will attribute judging like we're ultimately God when they see us. But we have to always understand that it's not us who gets to determine that anyway. It's the Lord. So making that distinction is interesting. So yeah, they're they're really saying that. But even Jesus said, "Don't don't look to yourselves as that look unto me," because they're they're really mad at me, not mad at you at all. All right. Well, I hope tonight at least we've heard a lot of conversation, a lot of talk. Um, if nothing else, I hope if you still don't have a grasp on this subject somewhat. Read the book. <laughs> I hope it pricks a few people's hearts, and, and if you have any questions on it. So I will, I will close, and we'll call it a night. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you for being here, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for, for the, the fellowship, the learning, the digging into your word, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, that, that you are awesome, and I thank you, Lord, that you are going to be the ultimate judge and not us. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for your mercies and grace that's new every day. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.